Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the ECG workout for the week of July 8th, 2019. And this week, we're going to finish up with part three of our answers to the 7th Annual University of Maryland Emergency Medicine Residency ECG competition, which was held June 12th, just a few weeks ago. Again, this week, we're going to do part three of the answers, which really is just question number 12. That's the last question that we have not gone through yet. And I felt that this was a novel topic, something that we've never discussed before in all the years we've been doing ECG Weekly. It's something that I personally just recently learned about within the past year or so. And I've finally come across a couple of good representative cases. And one of these cases showed up on the competition as question number 12. And so we're going to spend an entire session just focused on that. Before we do though, I wanted to announce the winner of our competition. This is just within our residency program just to put some props out to her. It's Dr. Sarah Mahansky. She's one of our fantastic senior third year residents. She's well she just finished our residency program on June 23rd. That was the last day for our residents and she's working in Pittsburgh. She's going to be there for at least the next year or so and we're really hoping that maybe we'll be able to get her back to University of Maryland at some point in the near future. But if you run across her path, well, you should know that you are in the midst of a fantastic young emergency physician. So congratulations to Sarah. And let's get on to this week's case. This was actually sent to me by Dr. Yasir Abu Baker. He had this patient and he and his colleagues were pretty much on top of the diagnosis, so kudos to them for making the diagnosis. The question here was as follows. This is a 41-year-old man who comes in with chest pain. His ECG shown below. You're trying to decide whether this is early repolarization versus an acute MI. First part of this, choose your diagnosis. And then I want you to explain the findings on this ECG that support your diagnosis. In other words, what is it on this ECG that supports your choice of early repolarization versus an acute STEMI, essentially? So the first part of this that I need to mention is that in this case, we're only talking about those cases or those scenarios where you're debating, is this ECG early repolarization or is this a STEMI? So we're not talking about pericarditis. We've clinically already ruled that out. We're not talking about LVH or many of the other causes of ST elevation. When you've pretty much narrowed it down to early repolarization versus STEMI, that's where the things we're going to talk about this week really, really do apply. Now, a lot of people who looked at this case within our residency and also other people that emailed me after we posted this on the internet for everyone else to look at, a lot of people thought that this was early repolarization. And I guess you probably figure it's not because I'm, I'm stating it that way. What's the diagnosis here? Again, I want to emphasize that what we're going to talk about this week only applies when you're debating between early repolarization versus a STEMI, and this actually is a STEMI. And you don't want to miss STEMIs, of course. That's kind of a no-brainer statement. But that's why this topic is so important because there are so many people that looked at this 12-lead ECG and thought that this was early repolarization for good reason. When you look at most of the ST elevation as concave upwards, that's going to make you think of early repol. There's really no reciprocal ST depression in any of the leads. So it's a relatively benign early repol looking type of 12 lead ECGs. So you certainly can't blame anyone for making the diagnosis of early repolarization, but you've got to know what makes this a STEMI. So let's get into what are the things that really point you towards calling this a STEMI. First of all, if you look out here at the limb leads, you'll notice that the ST segment elevation is nice and concave upwards. That is very much consistent with early repol or a STEMI. So the limb leads really don't help you out here. Concave upwards ST elevation like that can really be either, but when you look out here at the lateral precordial leads, you'll notice that the ST elevation is horizontal. And we've talked about this with regards to pericarditis before. Early repolarization is like this as well. Benign early repol and pericarditis are only allowed to be concave upwards like you're seeing out here. When you see concave upwards, that can be anything. It can be benign early repol or pericarditis or STEMI. But anytime you see ST segment elevation, which is horizontal like you're looking at there, you'll notice the QRS comes down and it doesn't go right up into the T wave. The QRS goes down and then it goes horizontal and then it goes into the T wave. That's subtle, but when you see 
horizontal segments that very strongly points towards STEMI and not early repole and not pericarditis either. Even in a few leads, when you see horizontal segments like that, that very strongly points towards this being a STEMI and not pericarditis, or in this case, more importantly, not early repolarization. So I've typed out some of those things here as well. But the main crux of this week's case is focused on something that's referred to as terminal QRS distortion. And here's the paper that was written by Daniel Lee, Brooks Walsh, and Stephen Smith. Many of you know Stephen Smith. He's an outstanding electrocardiography expert from up at Hennepin, and he's published a lot of electrocardiography stuff. And this is the paper in which I first really, really learned about this. It's published just a few years ago, 2016. What exactly is terminal QRS distortion? I've heard of it before, but up until reading this paper, I didn't really know how important it is. This is something that if you pick up on this, it is enormously predictive of STEMI. So let's take a look at some QRST complexes. And specifically, we're going to talk about what J points are, what J waves are, and what S waves are, right? Don't confuse J points and J waves. These are two different things. Let's go through some of these complexes here. If you look up here at the first one, where is the J point? Well, the J point is where the QRS ends and it turns into the ST segment or turns into the T wave. Essentially, it's the very end of the QRS complex. So that is what we would call the J point. Notice that there's no S wave in this QRS. We call it a QRS, even though in reality, it's just a big R wave. There is no S wave. An S wave is defined as something that goes below the baseline. And if there's nothing that goes below the baseline, then there's no S wave. The way I just drew this now, that would be considered an S wave. But if we got rid of that, there's no S wave here. Let's move on over here. This is a nice concave upwards QRS going into the T wave. This could be a STEMI or early repolarization. Where's the J wave? Well, it's the end of the QRS. And so we'd probably estimate that that's about where the J wave is. It's a little bit tougher when there's a nice concave upwards gradual transition to the T wave, whereas over here, it's much more of a sharp defining J wave. But anyway, that's that's about where the J wave is. Let's, let's move over here. Okay, now in this case, this is the QRS complex right up there. Let me get rid of that. And in this case, we've got an S wave. So there is your S wave. I know for some of you, this is kind of a no brainer stuff. It's very simple, but I really think it's important to define these different things. So this patient has an S wave. Now, where is the J point in this patient? Well, the J point is where the QRS ends. So I would say that that's probably about where the J point is. That's where the QRS complex ends. That's the J point. Let's move down here. Now here's the QRS complex. There's the R wave going up there. Get rid of that. What's this little blip right there? That is a J wave, all right? Distinguishing that from a J point. The J point, as you see up here, we've circled it up there. We've circled the J point up here. We've circled the J point up here. But when the QRS complex comes down and there's a northern reflection before it comes back down, that's called a J wave. Notice that in this case up here, there's no J wave. There's no upward deflection. Over here, there's no upward deflection, so there's no J wave. Over here, there's a J point, but there's no J wave. There's no upward deflection. Over here, there is an upward deflection, and that's defined as the J wave. Not just the J point, but the J wave. Let's move on over here now. Now, in this particular case, you've got the R coming up and then is coming back down. Is there an S wave here? The answer is no. This is part of the R wave. That's not the S wave. It's only defined as an S wave if it drops below the baseline. So if I did that, then yes, now there's an S wave. But if it doesn't drop below this baseline, I've kind of made it a little bit off angle, but if it doesn't drop below the baseline, then it's not called an S wave. So that is an S wave. Now, however, there's no S wave in this case. So this is just an R wave, and that is the J point. It's called a J point, not a J wave. If this were an upward deflection like that, then there would be a J wave, but there's no upward deflection 
so it's just called a J point. And then if we come down here, in this particular case, you've got the R wave coming up, and then it goes back down, and it does drop below the baseline. So this is an S wave. And where does that QRS complex end? It probably ends right about there. So that's the J point right there. In this case, once again, there's no J wave because there's no upward deflection. There's just a J point. So again, I just want to make a distinction between what a J point is, what a J wave is. A J wave refers to that upward deflection. That's a J wave. And then what is an S wave? An S wave is defined as part of the QRS complex that drops below the baseline. So that would be an S wave, and that would be an S wave down there. So keep those things in mind as we go through the remainder of this discussion. Key point is listed up here. In order to diagnose benign early repolarization, you must have either an S wave or J wave in both V2 and V3. If V2 has no S wave or J wave, it cannot be called benign early repol. It's got to be called a STEMI when you're debating between these two things. If V3 has neither an S wave nor a J wave, you cannot call it benign early repol. You've got to call it a STEMI. So let's go through some examples here. Let's look at this. All right, take a look at lead V2. Is there an S wave or J wave? The answer is yes, there's a big S wave. Take a look at V3. Is there an S wave or a J wave? Well, there's no S wave because it doesn't come below the baseline, but there is a J wave. There's an upward deflection that the arrow is pointing at. So in this particular case, the patient has an S wave in V2 and a J wave in V3. So you are allowed to call this benign early repolarization. Next example, take a look at lead V2. Is there an S wave or J wave? The answer is yes, there's an S wave. Take a look at lead V3. Is there an S wave or a J wave? The answer is yes, there is a J wave, that upward deflection there. Because both V2 and V3 have an S or a J, you are allowed to call this early repolarization. All right, now let's take a look at the case, case number 12. Take a look at lead V2. Is there an S wave or a J wave in lead V2? The answer is yes, there's an S wave, all right? Take a look at V3. Is there an S wave or a J wave? Well, there's no J wave because there's the J point, but there's no upward deflection. It doesn't go north. It just stops and heads out into the T wave. So there's a J point, but there's no J wave. So let me ask that question again and leave V3. Is there an S wave or a J wave? There's no J wave and there's also no S wave because this does not extend below the baseline. Take a close look. That again, it does not extend below the baseline. So there's no S wave. What that means is that in lead V3, there's neither an S wave nor a J wave. Therefore, you are not allowed to call this benign early repolarization because the only way you'd be allowed to call this benign early repol is if there's an S wave or J wave in V2 and an S wave or J wave in V3. And in this example, there's no S wave or J wave in lead V3. So V3 means this cannot be early repolarization. This is an LAD occlusion. This is a STEMI. And once again, just blowing this up a little bit more, take a look again. Lead V3 has no J wave. There's no upward deflection. That makes a J wave. And there's also no S wave. This does not extend below the baseline. It, had how, it would have to extend deeper down in order for this to be considered an S wave, but it doesn't. It stops right at about the isoelectric point. So this cannot be considered benign early repolarization, and that means that we were looking at a STEMI. So it's a really cool case as far as I'm concerned in that it's subtle. It's very easy to misdiagnose this as early repolarization, but lead V3, because there's no S wave or J wave, this cannot be considered early repolarization. 
and that means that this is an acute STEMI. We'll try to get more examples of this in the near future and go through this just a little bit more. But once again, the quick take home points from this case, in order to diagnose benign early repo, you must have either an S or J in V2 and either an S or J in V3. If V2 has neither S nor a J wave, and V3 has neither an S wave nor a J wave, it cannot be benign early repo, and you've got to call it a STEMI. Well, that does it for this week, and that is what terminal QRS distortion is all about. It's the first time we've gone through this. Again, we'll try to go through more cases like this in the near future because I think this may not be a real common thing, but it can be a critically important thing to understand because it can help you distinguish between cases that are often overcalled as early repolarization, but actually turn out to be a STEMI. And as you know, it's critically important for us to make the diagnosis of STEMIs. So with that, I want to thank you all for participating in the seventh annual University of Maryland Emergency Medicine ECG competition. And we will be back to regular cases starting next week. Hope these cases have been helpful and I look forward to talking to you next week. Bye for now.